our uh, panelists uh, later at the beginning of the part two. It will be a roundtable uh, presentation. They will make their first uh, presentation in five minutes at the start, and there will be 20 minutes interaction with them, with the audience, uh, through a QA um, uh, tool. And there will be a poll of two questions popping up on your screen so you can vote on very easy answers of this question just to warm up the audience for this debate. The third part will be about how research can answer these needs and these, uh, these uh, gaps uh, facing the global challenges. And uh, we will have different an overview of, of different aspects of these answers from, from, the, from the CG initiative, from the TPP, from a specialist in the NARS, from Burkina Faso. So all this event is about doing research differently. Not only new questions of research, but doing research differently. There is a strong need to examine the way we do research, the way we fund research, the way we engage with a wide range of stakeholders, both locally and globally. The TPP, the Transformative Partnership Platform, is committed to explore ways to do research differently, to give scientists a way to fully and better play their role through inclusive partnerships to promote the changes that agriculture urgently needs. The TPP was founded two years ago, and one of its foundation has been a call signed by several uh, scientists from French institutions and the CGIR and, ex and explains what does mean doing research differently. We will put the link of this call in the chat. So with that, uh, I will uh, give the floor for the first part to Bernard Hubert for this introduction of, his, of this dossier. Um, and uh, with you, over to you, Bernard, to share your, your PowerPoint and to start your presentation. <coughs> so thank you very much. So a few words and for this first part to present this dossier. And myself, I'm uh, Bernard Ver. I'm an uh, emeritus researcher at INRAE and teacher at HSS. I'm the chair of the French Committee for International Agricultural Research, which was leading this process. So uh, <laughs> this for us, it's a way to present, an event to present this last number of the dossier of Agropolis International which is an organization in Montpellier gathering all research organization uh, in higher education organization, French and from abroad in Montpellier. And it has been published early September uh, to be in phase with uh, the <coughs> UN Food System Summit. And it's about agroecological transformations for sustainable food systems. And as Etienne told, it's an initiative from French researchers and CGI colleagues. Why is this dossier? The urgency of agroecological transformation of agri-food systems linked to SDGs has been one of the game changers discussed at the UN World Food System Summit this year, as I told. It's why we published it at that time. Clearly, the diversity of agriculture on this planet heroes the way to a variety of agroecological transition pathways, different baselines, input usage levels, socioeconomic context, and particularly different labor costs and availability. And also a diversity in terms of means for public action, subsidy levels that could be reoriented to incentivize, <coughs> incentivize change, research, and extension. There are also similarities in terms of understanding the biology, ecology, and socioeconomics of farming agroecosystems and their functioning, and how to manage risks including those triggered by climate change. And it will be on the agenda next week in Glasgow with the COP26. Who contributes to this issue? As Etienne told us, the authors are about 500 scientists and experts from around 100 national and international universities and research organizations from France, among others, CIRAD, INRAE, and IRD, and abroad and a lot of universities from the north, from the south, from Asia, Africa, Latin America, and so on, and from all CGIR centers. This dossier is not meant to be exhaustive, of course. The research examples presented reflect the diversity and the dynamism of scientific and technological research at national and international levels. So that far, we also try to link the five <coughs> 
levels proposed by Stephen Glissman's on food system transformation with the 10 elements of the FAO presented in the COAG in 2018, and also the 13 principle of the HLP report published in 2019. And, and this was very important for us in order to, to build the structure of, of the dossier, of the booklet. And it's why you can find also the organization according to these five levels. And the structure of the dossier is in two, in three parts. Two parts, uh, these two parts, part one and part two, are linked to these five levels proposed by Stephen Glissman. So, <clears throat> one in part one, it's mainly about the agroecosystems. And chapter one is increasing the efficiency of practices in order to reduce the use of costly, scarce, or environmentally damaging inputs. Chapter two, substituting intensive external input used by biodiversity derived ecosystems functions. And chapter three, redesigning agroecosystems on the basis of a new set of ecological processes from farm and landscape. And this will be illustrated just after myself by Stephanie <coughs> Christman who is working in Ikada, in Morocco. And part two is on the level four and five of Stephen Glissman. That's chapter four, identifying and overcoming constraints within food systems to achieve agroecological transitions at scale by connecting producers and consumers. And then we, this will be illustrated by Stephen McMillan just after me too, from, who is working at the craft in Kenya. Chapter five, the last one, of course, and really at stake after the summit, building a new global food system based on equity, participation, democracy, and justice. And then we had part three, with, between them chapter six, about key processes, methods, and tools for agroecology. And this will be illustrated by Muriel Mambrini about the living labs. And Muriel Mambrini is working at INRAE in France. So to conclude and to, 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 sort of to wrap up of this work, because it was we, we, we did that during uh, uh, seven months work, and really <coughs> we have to, to, to go in deep with all these this research presentations. So I can sort, I can emerge new research questions and a brand new way of doing research uh, as also a, a TN advocate too that changing the paradigmatic vision of food systems leads to address the multifunctionality of agriculture. Agriculture is not only the production of agricultural goods, food or not. To recognize the urgent and imperious necessity to respect ecosystems and martial nature and its resources, including biodiversity and its function. Then you need to address questions that have been overlooked by conventional approaches, like soil biodiversity, ecosystem functioning, optimization of functions at plot and landscape levels, resilience towards changes, and particularly climate change. Moreover, agroecology is dovetailed with principles such as fairness, social values, diets, land and local resource governance, which implies that scientific research but also focus on addressing questions linked to labor and market organization, stakeholder interactions, behavioral change mechanisms, social inclusion, public policies, added value distribution along agri-food supply chains, and so on. Agroecological approaches also imply new ways of doing research and contributing to innovation. Agroecological transformation requires hybridization of scientific knowledge, technological and institutional innovations, local actors, capacities and knowledge, public policies, infrastructures and means. It is a context dependent process with multiple transformational solutions and pathways and local innovation systems have a crucial role to play. So, Agroecology needs a collective approach. It is not a one-by-one -one advocacy. It has to be 
manage collectively, taking into, into account the diversity of people, diversity of knowledge, of means, of uh, <clears throat> geographical and ecological position in a watershed or things like that. Scientific research, therefore, has to produce knowledge to fuel these local innovation systems through new ways of cooperation with stakeholders, including policymakers, of course. This means accounting for the complexity of agroecosystem functioning in a diverse range of situations and settings by connecting biological, technical, and sociopolitical questions using inclusive, systemic, interdisciplinary, participatory, and transdisciplinary research is an advocacy to change how we are working with the others, and the world will change not only by scientists, but by the people who are living on this planet and working all together and with scientists and overcoming tensions <coughs> and, and, and confrontations we have. These are some of the ambitions of the Transformative pl Partnership Platform on Agroecology, TPP, with organizing this meeting and that has been jointly built by French research organizations and CGIR. Uh, two years Bernard? ago. Bernard? Oh, yeah. Can, can you go ahead? Yeah. That's the last one. That's uh, just uh, <coughs> to say that the editorial board is made of French people and people from CGIR. If you get any, if you want to contact, get contact Isabelle M. Salem, who supported us for all this job, or myself. His dossier is available in hard copy and digital format in English and will be in French at the end of this year. And issues can be downloaded as this address, which could be also put on, on the QR or the discussion. So we have a DOI, then you can find it anywhere. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Bernard. So now we have three authors of these dossiers. Uh, first, Stephanie Grisman from. Uh, you have the floor, Stephanie, from Ricardo. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity uh, to present here on uh, this new agroecological approach, farming with alternative pollinators, which benefits pollinators, natural animals, uh, yields, and offers transformative change to agriculture. Agroecology is often uh, a costly add-on uh, to conventional agriculture, but this is not scalable to low and middle income countries. For instance, pollinator protection uh, is mainly uh, done by wildflower strips, which require rewards uh, to farmers, and uh, the European Union can pay that, uh, but low and middle income countries cannot. Therefore, about uh, 10 years ago, I started to develop farming with alternative pollinators. Uh, farm fields use only 75% of the field for the main crop and 25% uh, for habitat enhancement, but not with wildflowers, weeds in the language of farmers, but with marketable habitats enhancement plants like oil seeds, spices, or vegetables. Nesting support out of local materials and water support. And then we compare, in comparison to monocultural control fields, the impact of habitat enhancement uh, concerning diversity and abundance of pollinators, natural enemies and pests, and net income per surface. So here you see the results uh, from a, a large project uh, in Morocco, but we did such projects also in uh, other countries. So the diversity of wild pollinators and of uh, natural enemies is much higher in fab fields than in control fields, while uh, the pest abundance in uh, fab fields is on average 65% uh, uh, lower. And as we used uh, for agroecosystem seven main crops <coughs> and a lot of farmer fields, it's a really robust average. So this means FAP works as a, a nature positive preventive pest control, same as seeds coated with neonicotinoids. But uh, FAP does not have uh, these uh, negative impacts on biodiversity. And, if I uh, can, you, can you make your, your screen 
Can you put in full presentation the screen? Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And 65% reduction uh, of um, pest abundance uh, is an argument for many farmers not to use pesticides at all. Here we see the impact on uh, net income. Uh, it's on average uh, more than 120%. Uh, though we even uh, added uh, additional uh, costs for harvesting uh, the marketable habitat enhancement plants, though the farmers did themselves. Uh, the incentive is method inherent and performance related. It is economically self-sustaining, different to the wildflower strips. And uh, FAP, uh, thus has a high potential for agroecological intensification and combat of malnutrition. We simulated this on the example of small holders in Morocco uh, with different assumptions uh, to see, uh, to show in the upper graph uh, the potential for um, higher food security, uh, more produce, and in the lower uh, graph uh, for reduce of land use change uh, for food production. This is quite important as for centuries uh, the land use change uh, decreases semi-natural lands, and this really threatens um, uh, biodiversity, and it's overdue to bend this curve. Um, I, I don't know why we have now this other voice. Uh, he, uh, can, can you stop the other voice? Yeah, you, you have uh, run your time, I think. Uh, but... Um, I don't get back to the screen now. Can you exit no, your, screen your is presentation black. mode? Please exit your presentation mode. Okay. You can continue speaking, thanks. Fabio, can, can you show the last screen? So this is a, an example for farmer-driven uh, pollinator protection and also an example for economically self-sustaining uh, uh, agroecology, which has much advantages in uh, comparison uh, to costly uh, add-ons um, uh, to conventional agriculture. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie, and sorry for the, the, the little problem with the last slide. The, the PowerPoint presentation will be on, online uh, during the, with the recording. With that, I would pass the floor to Stefa McMillan from c 4 Craft. Please, you have five minutes, Stefa. Okay, um, hello everybody. I'm very happy to be here today to share some of our work with you on customizing nutritious food tree portfolios for delivering more diversified diets in local food production systems. So we all know that there are multiple challenges affecting our global and local food systems. And one of them has been and is this narrow focus on a few crops that are nutritionally limited, undermining human health and also degrading ecosystems. And the availability of micronutrient rich crops like fruits and vegetables are often lacking in these local systems and they're highly season dependent. So in terms of local food systems, we need to look towards ways in which we can transform them for delivering a greater diversity of nutrient dense foods. And this calls for contextually relevant solutions. So one of these solutions or approaches that we've devised at c 4 ecraft are these nutritious food portfolios. And they're all about promoting diversity in local food production systems. These are carefully designed portfolios combining a diversity of different food tree species. So not only those that have fruits, but also other tree foods such as nuts and leaves with vegetable pulse and staple crops to address seasonal harvest gaps and also micronutrient deficits, which may exist in local diets. We co-develop these portfolios with communities based on site-specific information on food production diversity, on the local diets, and also the priorities of the community. So really the portfolios are all about enhancing seasonal availability of a greater diversity of more nutrient-dense foods. As I mentioned, it's all about co-development with our communities. So to devise these, these site-specific recommendations, we need to understand more about the sites. So in a first step, we look at food production diversity. Here we assess the different food and fodder production diversity, and we're really keen to also understand what are the indigenous and underutilized species that specific communities may be using and managing in their landscapes. 
In a second step, it's really important for us to understand food consumption diversity. What do the local diets look like? What are people consuming? And importantly, what foods and micronutrients may be missing from their local diets so that we can fill those gaps with some suitable recommendations. In a third step, we also undertake a priority setting with the communities. And this is really where we come together with the communities to discuss the full extent of species diversity that they use and manage. We um, go into the detail of the different functional uses that are important to the communities, also based on gender and generational differences so that we really understand what these communities are interested in. We also identify opportunities and challenges related to these species. And challenges may refer to a lack of quality planting material for certain food tree species, whereas opportunities may relate to market potential and the economic value. So once we've had all this rich discussion with the communities, we're then able to prioritize with the communities what are the species and the functional uses that are most important to them to meet their multiple needs. During this process, we also develop seasonal food harvest calendars, which are site specific, because quite often we are lacking phenology data um, for when these different species may be harvested. So using all this data, we're then able to customize these portfolios to a given site and to given communities. And I'm going to show you an example from Katui County in Kenya. So we first start with the prioritized list of food tree species that the communities have identified. The ones highlighted in yellow are indigenous species. We then do this for vegetable, pulse, and staple crops. So this is really to take a broader dietary approach with the portfolios. We map each of the species for the specific months that they are available across the calendar year taking particular note of the months when these communities may be most stretched by higher peaks of food insecurity. In a subsequent step, we then match each of the species for their micronutrient value, considering vitamin A, C, iron, and folate. And what we've done is we have developed a scoring system to simplify this nutritional information to indicate whether species may be a low source, a medium source, or a high source. And this really offers a good decision support tool for communities and other stakeholders to select species, not only based on when they're available, but also their micronutrient value and what they can deliver in local diets. So ultimately, the portfolios are a contextually relevant recommendation. It's all about promoting greater diversity of species on farms to enhance the seasonal food resilience of local communities and diversify diets. Indigenous and underutilized species should not be overlooked because quite often they have high nutritional value, they're more resilient and adapted to their landscapes, and they're very much linked to culture and tradition. We co-develop the portfolios with each of the communities that we work with. So this is really all about empowering communities by using their own knowledge. It's centered around their participation in the process, their social values and diets, their priorities for economic diversification, plus other principles of agroecology. In addition to these recommendations that we devise with different communities, we also engage in outreach and impact with these smallholder farming communities. And this relates to the seed system di um, dimension to make sure that communities have access to quality planting material, as well as relevant agriculture and nutritional information as it corresponds to the recommended portfolios. We've now developed these portfolios across 17 different sites in East Africa, and this approach can now be expanded and adapted to different regions and contexts. Thank you, Stefa. Can you Thank conclude? You. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. That's very illustrative and fascinating research. So with that, I would pass to uh, Muriel Mambrini from INRAE for the last illustration of, of, of one of these research of this portfolio, of the dossier. Muriel, you have the floor for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. It's really shaking to see uh, such work and all the ones of the world that has been presented in the dossier. And there we had the chance to present uh, the already project, uh, our current project, which aims to build the framework of a transnational network for living life for agroecology transition. As you said, Mr. Chairman, um, uh, agroecology transition means a strong evolution of the way we produce and share knowledge. So why uh, living labs can help then? 
um, to situate living labs, we can keep in mind that there are open innovation arrangements centered on three principles, concern the users, promote co-creation, and innovate in real conditions. They are really at the center of the interface between the four spaces concerned by innovation, technology, intelligence, uh, solutions, and combination of talent. And as a matter of fact, they are providing economical values but, and also social uh, innovation. They are diverse, they have been developed in many different fields, but they are adapted and they are diverse because they are ad adapted to the purpose and real conditions in which they are operating. But what they have in common is that their activities of co-creation are really well suited for development uh, and having collective experimentation. The context of real life use is really central and facilitates the share of knowledge and also the share of risks. The participants are really a combination between public, private, academic, and citizens in, in a different proportion, but, but they are combined. And the aim is not only to innovate, uh, but living labs have also an empowering effect. So knowledge intensive, they offer capacity to alternate between science and practice, to co-experiment and share risk, and learn from no local experience. And their participants are really keen to network because they want to share their practice. So promoting the development of living labs appeared to policymakers as a way to open and unlock the system of agricultural innovation. In France and Canada, for example, national programs have been launched in a very unusual way putting first the co-creation with the users locally, either for territorial development in France or for gaining resilience in the agricultural sector in Canada. The results are that in France, 10 among the 24 projects selected for territorial development deals with agroecology agro transition. This put high at the agenda, the, reg at the regional and national agenda, agriculture and food supply questions. In Canada, five big living labs and two more ten are currently running, bridging scientists from very different fields with local producers and policymakers to uh, improve uh, resilience. So we have outlined the unique features of such living labs situated on each side of the Atlantic. One of such features is the strong relatedness of the living labs with the agricultural research and their capacity to generate multi-actor processes. So when the EU appealed for the design of a framework, we candidated. And our first question was, will, what will Living Lab bring specifically for agroecology transition? So we translated the different frames that uh, Bernard Huber exposed uh, at the beginning into the types of activities that can be expected to happen on field. On one side, we categorized uh, the uh, activities that can be seen in the agri-food system and on the, on the other side, the activities that will help taking into account the context. And clearly what Living Labs will help to do is really to bridge those two uh, phases to really accelerate uh, the transition. But I what I would like to point out with you is a representation of what is going in the Living Labs for a scientist. And I like this representation of a uh, uh, specialist in water uh, quality, an, agron an agronomist who was really used to work with the different specialists to provide a solution for the users. Whereas his experience in a living lab was really putting the user at the center, helps the different experts to work more together and to, uh, for increasing uh, the, the water quality through iteration. And you can see here that the shift of paradigms effect of the living labs is going on. So, um, uh, of course, living labs are not all, but the, what we can really say is that they are really well suited for what is need for, needed for agroecology transition. Our work for proposing the right framework for the future network of living labs and research infrastructure pursues has been a pleasure to share with you our first results, and we'd be more than happy to get your insights and know better the initiatives worldwide to improve. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Maria. It was very clear and, and crisp. And, and these three uh, illustrations of this dossier, I hope it gives you uh, the, 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 the willingness to get to this dossier because it's fascinating the diversity of the landscape of research in agroecology in this dossier, mobilizing over 500 researchers around the world. 
So without waiting more, uh, slightly behind the, the time. So we're going to pass to pass to part two uh, about the, I would say the perspective from outsiders of research about the needs to do research. So I would, I would ask uh, uh, to uh, the three panelists to keep their camera on. And uh, so uh, everybody can see the panelists there. And I will ask the question um, about, uh, about how do you see the need of uh, doing research differently? Are there specific knowledge gaps or domains that requires new research uh, investments? Are they a new way of doing research that you recommend for research? So I would pass first uh, the floor to His Excellency, the Ambassador Miguel Garcia Winder from Mexico. Miguel, you have the floor for five minutes. Thank you, Dr. Heinstein. Uh, allow me to start by, by thanking the organizers and tell you how deeply honored I am to participate in, in, in this conversation. Not only honored, but humbled to share the floor with such a group of experts. And I'm sure that in the audience, we have a uh, tremendous vast of knowledge. I just hope I can contribute a little bit. Uh, and let me, let me start by, by saying that my country, Mexico, has a very long standing tradition in agroecology. Uh, much more before we started using the term agroecology and probably since the 1950s and 1960s so the previous years. You know, we have different names, ethnobotanics, um, campesino systems, campesino productions. And, and so I, it is important for you to look into the Mexican experience. Uh, there are two works that I would recommend. One is uh, it's a work by Astier published in 2015 that makes a, a great summary of the history of agroecology in Mexico, the social movements and the scientific movements. And also it gives you insight of some of the traditional science and innovation in this, in this process. The other is, is a work of Glisman in 1991 with a seminar work uh, where he brings the issues of agroecology to an area that basically the tropical areas. Uh, Mexico also has, uh, the present time and in the past, a very strong institutional arrangement that uh, allows agroecology, uh, should allow the agroecology to process. Uh, we have the national law of rural development, we have laws of climate change, on environment, uh, forestry, uh, all of these laws set the basis. So science cannot progress unless we have a tremendous uh, set of, of, uh, of institutional principles. And in the current administration, we have a very strong suggest, a, a very strong effort to, uh, to put agroecology in, in mainstream. And there is a, a group called HISAMAT that is doing a, a great job. The other thing is important is you need capacity to do this. And Mexico has one uh, series of institutions from the traditional institution like Chapingo and Colegio de Graduados to younger institutions uh, like the Colegio de Frontera del Sur who are working on agroecology and have specific programs and training in agroecology. Uh, if, if you ask me what type of, of research is needed, and this is just my personal opinion, coming one time I was a researcher, but coming from my opinion, I think we need to increase scientific research around agroecology. Uh, yesterday, by accident, he came to my desk a, a, a paper who shows that bacteria, viruses, and fungi are important for drought resistance in plants. Uh, so we cannot only study what the plant does, but we need to, to study how the system goes. So we need to increase scientific knowledge. And, and we are in an opportunity to bridge the divide between the hardcore agroecology that said only has to be empirical and the hardcore scientists. We had to find a way to bring this. The second area that I think we need to do research is what are the policy and innovations that are needed. So we need to work on creating new policies and new innovations. The third area, I'm sorry I'm running, but the time is short. We can probably discuss later on. But the other research, and I think some of my previous speaker already suggested, we need to do research on social interactions, market and consumers. This is tremendously important for us to, to contain. So there are some critical issues that I see, and the critical issues are basically uh, three, three types. Investments, public investment and private investments for the development of this new research. The subsidies, 
uh, we need to have subsidies for this to, to, to succeed. Uh, and we have to have uh, some sort of rights and uh, protection of rights, particularly indigenous and local rights. So these are some of the critical issues that we need to address in research. In conclusion, I think we are uh, at the stage that we can bridge the divide between the different types of agriculture. And I want to finish with a phrase from uh, Efrain Hernandez Cholocotzi, which was the father of agroecology uh, for many of us, is that we need to develop programs that are congruent with our history, custom, traditions, ambitions of the world. That is, there is not a solution to feed all, and basically research has to be at the local level. Uh, thank you very much, and I took 24 uh, more seconds that I expected. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. That was a great uh, a public view from, from uh, uh, policymakers. Uh, we come back to that in the, the roundtable debate. Now I will give the floor to Gifor, um, um, who is a policy officer at INPA, European Commission. Guy, you have the floor for five minutes. Merci. Je vais donc parler uh, en français. Uh, so please, je... please put your interpretation channel at the bottom of your screen. There will be interpretation in into English and Spanish. Thank you. Go ahead, Guy. Okay. So uh, je vais parler uh, en français. Uh, à INPA, uh, on supporte, on, on finance les actions de recherche et innovation, et en particulier, on finance uh, uh, les recherches menées dans le cadre du, du CG, mais aussi on a tout un programme, uh, uh, toute une initiative appelée Désira, visant à accompagner la transformation des systèmes alimentaires pour traiter les questions du changement climatique, mais avec une approche uh, agroécologique et de plus en plus, on pousse uh, cette uh, dimension. Et on est convaincu, et c'est une partie de notre argumentaire que l'on a besoin de recherche pour développer les approches agroécologiques et pour lever certains goulots d'étranglement et pour arriver à des performances qui soient tout à fait supérieures à celles des systèmes conventionnels. Donc, on a besoin de la recherche. Mais pour ça, on pense qu'on a besoin d'une recherche différente de la recherche conventionnelle c'est-à-dire qu'on a besoin d'une recherche qui a une approche holistique, systémique, pour comprendre la complexité des interactions écologiques, mais aussi pour prendre en compte les dimensions sociales au niveau des systèmes de production, des chaînes de valeur, des territoires. Et puis, on a besoin d'une recherche qui permette de produire des connaissances qui sont adaptables et utiles au niveau local. Et donc, de travailler pour cela avec les acteurs locaux en mélangeant, en mixant connaissances scientifiques et connaissances des acteurs locaux. Donc, on pousse beaucoup, et dans le cadre de Désira, c'est un des principes, d'une part, à des approches multi-acteurs. Et je pense que les Living Labs qui ont été présentés auparavant s'inscrivent dans cette perspective, mais aussi des approches partenariales où on doit travailler entre différents organismes de recherche. Pour nous, l'Europe et les pays partenaires en Afrique, Asie, Amérique latine, mais aussi avec le CG et des approches partenariales entre acteurs de la recherche et autres acteurs du secteur privé, du secteur public, organisations de producteurs. Donc, multi-acteurs, partenariats, c'est quand même des mots clés qui paraissent parfois évidents dans certaines enceintes, mais qui, dans d'autres enceintes où l'on traite de la recherche, ne sont pas des mots euh, et des concepts qui sont complètement partagés. Euh, on doit aussi, dans ce contexte-là, finalement pousser pour que la recherche joue ou les chercheurs jouent des rôles différents. Bien sûr, production de connaissances, bien sûr, mise au point de technologies pour changer les pratiques des agriculteurs ou des opérateurs, des chaînes de valeur ou des territoires, mais aussi des rôles autour de la facilitation des processus d'innovation, des rôles pour euh, de formation, de renforcement des capacités des acteurs, parce que c'est les acteurs qui innovent, ce n'est pas la recherche qui pousse à l'innovation. Et puis, des rôles d'interaction, d'appui aux politiques publiques pour les améliorer. Donc, véritablement, on veut à la fois une forme d'excellence dans la recherche, mais aussi une recherche qui soit impliquée dans les processus d'innovation. 
Donc, c est, c est, cette façon de voir la recherche n'est pas forcément admise par tous les cercles de chercheurs, mais non plus par tous les, euh, les bailleurs de fonds, euh, dans, notamment euh, pour certains, certains mécanismes de financement qui cherchent à obtenir des résultats euh, plus centré sur la production de connaissances et des résultats à plus court terme pour appuyer l'innovation. Il faut donc que l'on puisse admettre, et ça c'est un enjeu dans le cadre de nos enceintes, hein, au niveau des bailleurs de fonds, institutions publiques, d'accompagnement du développement, que le changement prend du temps et que ce sont des investissements dans le partenariat avec les acteurs dans le temps et que le temps du projet n'est qu'un instrument de mise en œuvre des actions et que l'on doit s'inscrire dans la durée. Et cette conception, cette prise en compte de la durée n'est quelque chose qui n'est pas toujours partagé par, par l'ensemble des opérateurs de développement. Le dernier point sur lequel je voudrais insister, c'est sur les mécanismes de financement. Euh, on a à la fois besoin de s'inscrire dans la durée, donc d'avoir un accompagnement des acteurs dans la durée, mais on a aussi besoin de s'entendre sur des, des programmes de recherche qui euh, s'inscrivent dans au moins le moyen terme. Et je pense que l'expérience du CG, euh, avec la mise en place de ces initiatives, fait partie de cette démarche-là où l'on crée des programme avec une vision à moyen et long terme et on s'inscrit dans des financements dans la durée au-delà de financements de projets de courte, de courte durée. Le dernier point que je veux soulever autour des, des financements, c'est l'importance de travailler avec les acteurs, non seulement de la recherche, mais les partenaires pour créer ces programmes de recherche et pour pouvoir élaborer la programmation. Dans le cadre de la programmation de l'Union européenne 2021-2027, sur des programmes d'appui à l'agroécologie mobilisant la recherche, on va développer toute une série de concertations avec les acteurs de la recherche et de la société civile pour essayer d'identifier les gaps de connaissances et ce qui pourrait être utile en termes de recherche pour accompagner la transition agroécologique. Merci. Merci beaucoup, Guy. Thank you very much, Guy, for this uh, crispy uh, presentation from a funder point of view. Um, I, we will come back to some of the points during the uh, debate, I'm sure. Now I would like to pass the floor to Million Belay, uh, who is a general coordinator for the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa, kind of representing the social, uh, the civil society perspective about the research. Go ahead, Million. Thank you very much and thanks for the invitation. I always say that, you know, Africa is a graveyard of so many initiatives, so many programs. I think there are a lot of explanations for that. And one of them, uh, I think, is um, the way research is done. Um, to, to, to just give you an, an illustration, uh, I remember Uh, giving a presentation at the Stockholm Resilience Center once and somebody asked me, um, you know, we have produced these highly productive maize varieties to, to women farmers in Uganda and uh, women farmers wouldn't accept it. And they, Do you know what the reason is? And I say, hey, did you ask them, you know, did you participate them in the research itself? So there are so many examples like that in the, I think, uh, Uh, the, 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 the participation is one of the 13 principles of uh, agroecology and uh, in the 10 principles of, uh, in the 10 elements of agroecology, there is co-creation of knowledge. What does it mean? Why do we co-create knowledge? Why do we have to, to participate uh, farmers, fisher folks, pastoralists, you know, those affected by Oh, those are not affected, those are a part of, you know, the, 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 the food system. They know, they know the, 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 the seed varieties, the diversity, they have even names for them. They know the soil varieties that they have, they know the insects, and they can, they can explain to you the interaction that they have between the, 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 the landscape and, and their farm, their animals, even, even the cosmos. Uh, so we have to, we have to, we have to really recognize that knowledge. 
but there is this epistemological superiority among the, the researchers in most of the cases. So they talk about it, they give lip service to, to participation, but they go to fields and they don't really participate them. The only participation is in, by giving data, by giving information, and they say that they, they, they have participated. They have to participate in the problem identification uh, to begin with, in the kind of data that should be collected, in the data collection, and also in, in, in analysis. I know this can be challenging to so many researchers, to many uh, research uh, 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 kinds of research, but uh, they have to be pa participating and it has to be a genuine participation. And agroecology talks about you know, science, uh, practice in the and in, in social movements and re, we need research around the social movement we operate uh, in africa us for example under this green revolution agenda the green revolution agenda has its own research agenda uh, and, uh, and 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 we, we can we can we can give the number of examples that it's no working in africa it's impacting in africa there are a lot of researchers minted out of this process. They are doing a lot of research and their research in most of the, the research centers is, is to, to, to produce seeds which do respond to agrochemicals basically. So, so what kind of research do we need? You know, we have to really, uh, I mean, uh, accept this, this context and we have to do research around uh, social movements. Uh, there has to be research also on the political economy of the food system so that we understand the socio-political context around around uh, around the great college thank you very much thank you very much for this kind of sobering balance of conventional research in africa but i think it it raised some very relevant points about the challenge uh, lying ahead for researchers to be efficient in promoting changes thank you million uh, now i would like to finish this round table uh, with uh, uh, Ms. Rick Oliveira, who, who is a senior global technical specialist at IFAD, uh, to give the perspective of a multilateral agency for development. Rick, uh, you have the floor. Thank you very much. And also thank you for the invitation to participate in this panel. Um, so maybe it's just a very short overview of what we do in agroecology in IFAD. But we have recently uh, done a stock take on, on what we do. And it turned out that like 60% of our projects are actually promoting agroecology practices in some way or the other. Um, so, so this is quite a good number. So what is this being driven by? One point is it's driven by the farmers themselves because many IFA projects are actually designed to be demand driven. So the design contains that we invest through business plans or production development plans that are presented by farmers group and their organizations. So in a lot of those, agroecology is there. So that's why we invest in it. The other reason why we invest so much in that is because of EFAT's mainstreaming priorities. So we can clearly see from this stock take that what is driving this is our priority of climate change, resilience and nutrition, which has also been mentioned by other speakers. These are very important for agroecology or set the other way around, agroecology is very good at supporting those mainstreaming priorities. So 96% of projects supporting agroecology in, in the EFAT portfolio is, is also supporting climate change. And this is compared to only 18% for project not supporting agroecology. So we see a clear benefit there. And the same can be said on nutrition when 92% of projects supporting agroecology um, put, supports nutrition compared to only 20% of projects not supporting agroecology. So this is a little bit just a picture of, of what we do. Um, this study also looked into what type of agroecology activities are actually done in our projects, both at farm level, landscape level, in, in creating access to markets that values agroecology produced products, <laughs> um, and also the support for the policy enabling environment. Um, so when we looked at the activity groups around co-creation and sharing of knowledge that has been mentioned here today is very, very at the core of what, if, what, what agroecology does, it's in its values, we found that 85% of projects are supporting this type of activity group. So that is quite high. So when they work on agroecology, they actually have this element included. Um, 
this is positive, but maybe not that surprising because IFA has a very long tradition in supporting farm or field schools. And that is, as, as many of you may know, an approach um, that is dedicated to experimental learning among farmers uh, and, and in that sense fits very well with co-creation. However, while this is at the core of farmer field school, we also do see throughout our portfolio that sometimes it's watered a little bit down to more being used as a demonstration plot approach where the experimentation part is less strong or sometimes even absent altogether. So as part of rethinking small-scale producers' participation in research and support for community-led research agendas for further upscaling of agroecology, there is a need for refreshing this farmer field school approach as an important entrance point for participatory action research, which is at the core of, of the thinking, as I mentioned, in agroecology. Um, as an investment organization, um, that is focused at the support of, of investing with farmers through the government. We don't support upstream research, so our core focus is at exactly the, these aspects of research, the participatory, the action research with farmers. One weakness that we often see in our projects to make this happen more effectively is um, small scale farmers lack of capacity and tradition for even simple record keeping. So this is down to the very gritty nitty. Um, so as if, if we should propose, but, but an important role for researchers would be in this policy of research approach to be to facilitate farmers own research agenda and their capacities um, with setting up their experience, record keeping and analyzing data, and even using this data for the decision making. So I think that's a role researchers could also play. How do we involve farmers in research and give them the capacities that they need to be able to innovate? innovate. Um, when we manage to do that, it can have quite transformative impacts. One example of that is from IFAS project in the semi arid region in the northeastern part of Brazil. Um, this, these projects are using what is called agroecology log book approach. And these are books where women keep record on the diversity of crops they cultivate in their backyard gardens, and also what they collect in landscape um, for food and for income generation for their families. So these log books have proven to be a very powerful way for the women to learn and share with each other but also visualize their work and contributing to the family and community economy and the nutrition. So this has led to an increase in their production activity. So they get excited about this even more because it has a value, it's a visualized value. And the use of agrobiodiversity is increasing and even more women are joining in. Um, another approach that we have also learned from our portfolio in, in Brazil that we are trying to replicate um, is to invest, instead of investing through business plan with farmers, groups, groups of farmers, that we instead invest through development plans for agroecology transition proposed by a network of actors um, in a territory. So they come together and propose to the project funding what they want to do and how they want to do it together. And these actors include everything from the farmers organization, of course, at the core, but it could be a lot more than one. So we don't go farmer organization by farmer organization. We encourage them to work together and come with this joint proposal. But then they can also include the NGOs that are often providing technical assistance and other type of, of support. And they can improve research partners working with the farmers in, in introducing innovations and solving concrete barriers in their farming and commercialization systems. So this would be another way of investing for us instead of investing through just one producer organization, which can sometimes have limitations in engaging with action research institution on their own. But if they work together in networks and they have this more territorial view, um, that would be a new way of, of investing and, and trying to link all the dots. Um, my final point would be on the research gaps for agroecology upscaling. Even though it's improving, we still find that we need much more evidence on the socioeconomic and the food security benefits for small-scale producers of different agroecological farming systems. 
uh, as an investment organization with a clear mandate to address rural poverty, we need this evidence in our guidance and collaboration with the governments, farmers, producer organization in finding sustainable pathways out of poverty and the role agroecology can play in this. Um, we need this evidence, so hard data, uh, that's really needed. So in that sense, we need researchers to work with small scale producers in documenting how cost structures and income streams for their farms and landscapes are changing in the agroecological agro transition process. Um, how is this increase in the diversity of outputs securing more resilience in income streams that they often would experience when they transit to agroecology system? Um, so it's important to look at the annual income from farm output instead of just looking at the yields per hectare for one crop, because this is the it's a particularity of agroecology systems. Um, they are resilient because they, are, they, are, they have multiple outputs. Uh, having a lot more evidence in these aspects would also support our work with farmers and development partners in finding the best way of investing. So setting up the best uh, support mechanism for upscaling agroecology. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rick. We kind of have a, a behind the schedule, and I, and I see there are many questions in the audience. Thank you for this full perspective, very complimentary. Uh, uh, with that, I, I would uh, invite you to ask the question in the, the poll specifically for the outsider's perspective on research, and we try to treat the other question in the part three. With that, I would like to start with the polls. Uh, very simple pause. I'm going to read the question and you're going to have the questions on a pop up uh, screen. The first poll will be, and you have to vote, one, just one answer for this poll. What is the first priority for doing research differently for you in agroecology? First, to become more inclusive and participatory, to be more systemic, to have a more food system and territorial approach, or to be more action oriented and aligned with the SDGs. Just to warm up. So you have just one minute to answer that. And we're gonna then put on the screen the results for this almost 400 participants. In the meantime, uh, we're gonna synthesize some of the questions. We have many questions. You can vote for the questions also. Uh, to make them higher in priority rank. And we try to treat some of them. Okay, we're gonna close the poll shortly. So if you haven't voted yet, please, I'll give you another 10 seconds. Okay, I think you can you can yes. go ahead. There are still some uh, replies coming in. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna cut it in five, four, three, two, one. Okay. All right. So here are the results. Okay. So uh, there is clearly uh, the first point about inclusive and participatory is an an echo to what has been said by several of them. Of, of, the, of the panelists about the capacity to engage stakeholders for programming, doing, analyzing uh, the data and, and, and uh, create change. So uh, uh, that's good to know, 42% uh, for that and other obviously uh, answer are, are all right as well. We'll go to the second question now, second poll. Which of the five research domains that are here are most missing today? Just one choice. Biophysical mechanisms for agroecological production, agroecological markets, value chains and consumption, public policies to enable agroecological transition, private sector engagements on business models, or behavioral changes for both producers and consumers. So go ahead, make, you, make your choice. Okay, so there is a, a big uh, voting for public policies. Uh, one of the implementation gaps uh, uh, for the TPP is the public policies, and I think it's, it's fair. 
but uh, as as well, you can see that the behavioral changes in private sector and markets are also present in the vote. So it shows that the the basic research on mechanism is is going behind. It may be because of the audience, but obviously it seems that we have a lot of results already, but uh, not always the capacity to promote change at local uh, uh, level. So thank you very much for this poll, and with it. I would like to start uh, redirecting some of the questions we, we received to the panelists. Uh, there, there are two questions uh, that coming from, from the, the audience about the, the, the question on research on, on markets. Uh, one, one of the question is about how uh, the current market systems um, are able to respond to the agroecological uh, approach. Uh, so, and how you see the, the the public policy role in this uh, market situation. And uh, so I, I would just go around the panelists and I will also like to put another question which came frequently in the panelist presentation about the capacity of the actors. Uh, if you can uh, connect these two questions because in the markets you have many actors involved in this question of capacity and the capacity also of researchers to interact with them is key. So. With that, I would like to give to Million uh, first uh, the floor to answer in two minutes and to react to two minutes to this question of market. Million. Yeah. Uh, the market research is very much important. We did research uh, as HAFSA on, on markets, you know, what kind of agroecological markets are conducive for transition to agroecology. Uh, you can go to our website to, to see the result of that research. Uh, it has shown us that you know we need to focus on territorial markets, um, and, and uh, the focus should also be convening agroecological entrepreneurs and the connection between service providers um, and uh, and agroecological entrepreneurs was huge. You know, uh, the people who work in in banks in other 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 entities do not know how to supply the necessary material to agroecological entrepreneurs. But the capacity, I think there is a, there has to be a, probably a teaching of the research body on how to interact with local communities. Uh, it doesn't mean that they know how to do it. As I say, they, they go with this epistemological superiority to, to, to begin with. Uh, they, they feel like they're superior, knowledgeable, the local communities also, there has to be a teaching. And, uh, there has to be the equal level of interaction of uh, in the two knowledge systems. It, it is happening in, in, in some instances, there are ways of how to do it. So it's not that it's not tried, it, it is out there. So, but this has to be taken in, researchers have to be really taught. And at the local community level also, as it is said, uh, probably this, this documentation or whatever, uh, is not the practice, it is uh, probably the oral knowledge, uh, historical knowledge, uh, knowledge of the landscape. It may not be written, but it is there. So the, the question is how do, what kind of methodologies do you use to mobilize this knowledge? Uh, that's okay. very much important. So, so it, it becomes also a methodological question. So thank you very much. I'm sorry I have to leave now. Thank okay, you. okay, but just to, to follow up on your answer, I would ask if for, with this uh, program, Desira, who is aiming at change at scales in agroecology uh, specifically. This question of capacity is very linked to the question of scale. Uh, uh, there is also the capacity of researchers to engage with stakeholders and million mentioned that. But what about the, the capacity of the other stakeholders? Uh, and, and maybe Rika Inifad has also answered about that and she touched that in her presentation, but how did you deal that with in Desira? In this era program, Guy. Merci. Donc, euh, dans le programme des IRA, oui, la, la question du renforcement des capacités des acteurs est un des principes euh, clés euh, du programme, parce que ce sont les acteurs qui innovent, comme je l'ai dit tout à l'heure, ce ne sont pas les, les chercheurs. Et donc, il faut renforcer cette capacité euh, d'innovation notamment parce que la question de l'innovation à l'échelle qui, 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 qui est beaucoup posée dans le, le cadre des bailleurs, on doit avoir des impacts à l'échelle, 
dans le cadre de l'agroécologie, ne repose pas sur le passage à l'échelle de technologies standards, comme on a pu le faire pour la Révolution verte, mais passe par un changement d'échelle, on va le dire, de processus d'accompagnement des acteurs pour qu'ils identifient eux-mêmes des solutions. On peut tirer des leçons, on peut avoir des exemples de ce qui se passe ailleurs, mais dans chaque territoire, finalement, les acteurs doivent trouver leurs propres solutions et pour ça, doivent en avoir les capacités. De ce fait, dans le cadre de la nouvelle phase des IRA, un accent particulier va être mis sur le renforcement des capacités des acteurs pour innover en leur en les dotant de financements particuliers pour qu'ils puissent eux-mêmes mener des recherches et innovations et eux-mêmes développer des collaborations avec les recherches. Quelque part, inverser le regard et donner les capacités aux acteurs de mener leur propre processus de recherche et innovation. Euh, un exemple, est, on travaille avec Agricord, une agence euh, d'appui aux organisations de producteurs, euh, pour euh, mettre en place un projet de renforcement des capacités des organisations de producteurs pour mener des recherches et des, accompagner des processus d'innovation en agroécologie. Et ce sont les organisations qui vont mobiliser la recherche pour pouvoir euh, apporter cette connaissance scientifique. Et on pense que cette façon de faire permet d'équilibrer aussi les efforts de renforcement de capacité en mettant les acteurs en situation euh, d'expérimentation. Ok, merci. Thank you very much, Guy. Uh, that's a very strong statement you said about. It's not researchers that innovate, but it's more the, the actors. So I would like to ask uh, Rika to follow up on that about the capacity to innovate and the scale of change, uh, because IFAT's remit is exactly to promote the change of scales. So Rika, what could you say about that, the capacity role in your programs? Yeah, I, I think what, what we gain a lot from is, is this demand-driven designs that we have. So people can propose and they can propose with other actors what they want to do. And I think the demand driven part is quite important if you want to have people to innovate, give them a space. So don't give a pre prescription from the project side, what should be financed and how things should be done. And then, as I said, as, as trying to learn, how do we make sure that more actors get involved to inspire each other to reach the innovation? And, and I also gave the other point that to do more systematic innovation, we need to support farmers in particular, but also women's group, youth group. How do you do experimental learning? How do you innovate? Um, and, and again, through the partnership. So, so what also happened with these log group groups that I mentioned was that that was in a partnership with an NGO, of course, that was supporting the women's and then they slowly take it on themselves and, and move it on. And then visualizing and helping people to keep locks, which is a simple thing for some of us, but for other people, it's not usual because they have so much knowledge, but it's most in the head and what they talk about. And what, but having locks and really more systematic information, that can actually move innovation. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Rika. We kind of a uh, late, but I have a last question for Ambassador Miguel uh, about subsidies. Uh, as you see, the poll uh, show that public policy is central for the change. And so uh, we have many questions. We synthesize one about uh, subsidies, uh, at, at the same time, subsid subsidizing the change, agroecological change, and stopping the subsidy for conventional intensification. What could you say about that? Is there, is there a role for research in that, in that understanding of subsidy role? Uh, thank you, and hopefully you don't take it against me because I'm the only one wearing a, a tie today. But, uh, Uh, but, but let me tell you, the issue of subsidies is a very sensitive issue. And, uh, and I think we have been fighting for the reduction of subsidies for the last 40 years, at least, or 30 years. And there is a strong economic interest by some big countries and regions not to do so. Uh, and some of these regions are the ones promoting agroecology, very big subsidies. When I use subsidies, I probably have used the, the incentives. We in the developing countries need to develop incentives for smallholder farmers to develop agroecological projects. 
So it's not about the issue of subsidies as a whole. We need to reduce subsidies. There is a lot of research on, on, on the negative impacts of subsidies. What I think we need to develop in agroecology is what are the best approaches to provide incentives to, uh, to, to farmers. Because for many of these farmers, uh, conventional agriculture is agroecology, not industrial agriculture, it's conventional agriculture. They live, the transpatio farmers, the milpa farmers, uh, they are conventional agriculture, this is agroecology. So maybe what we need to do, and, and I got to rephrase probably my, the use of subsidies, is how research uh, can help us uh, as a policymakers to orient incentives and instruments of policy for the, the smallholder farmers and the medium sized farmers to try uh, on their agroecology, access markets, and make a profitable living for a better way of living. Uh, the you. issue of subsidies is sensitive, and we need okay. to raise the subsidies in agriculture. But as you, as you, thank you, Ambassador. I, I think you, I can mention that TPP started a big uh, research program on, on public policy, and subsidy is a big part of it. So uh, with this, uh, we kind of uh, lay, so I, I would like to pass to the third part, how research can answer to all these needs, new needs emerging and uh, challenges. Um, we have many, many questions. We have a back office that is kind of synthesizing these questions to orient the, the debate. Uh, but I would like to thank you uh, again, the panelists for this part two, and uh, we're gonna pass to the part three um about the the answers of of research through experience and 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 and, and uh projects so marcella and matthew will start with the new uh, cg initiative that is being built now about agroecology so marcella you have the floor i would say for seven minutes if you can show them to leave the, the space for the the interaction with the audience thank you thank you Etienne, and thanks also for the organizers so I think I want to start by saying that during this event and also through this uh, dossier that we are launching today, we have seen the broad capacity in multiple disciplines applied to our ecology projects in the CGIR, in French research organizations, and in many other par uh, partners organizations. So our ecology is not new in the international and national agricultural research agenda. However, I think there is therefore an immense opportunity right now to combine these capabilities to take our ecology research to another, another level. And where our ecology is applied at the food system level and at the territorial level. So in the CIR, we have been now not only, I mean, with uh, people inside of the CIR, but also listening others from outside of the CIR and also through an ample uh, consultation uh, in different countries. Uh, we have been thinking, okay, what could be those uh, elements that a new research agenda in our ecology should have, and especially thinking on the new research agenda of the one CIR. So I want to emphasize three main aspects, and my colleague Matthew McCartney, who has been with me working on, on this thinking and facilitating this process, will highlight other aspects. So the first aspect I want to highlight is is that we need a platform for conduct, conducting systematic research in agroecology across different uh, contexts and, and in developing countries. So, so we are proposing, for example, the establishment of a network of agroecological living labs in developing countries where agroecological innovations can be co-designed from the beginning with their users. And at the same time, uh, these are living labs that are going to enable to do scientific evaluation on, on what is the performance of those agroecological innovations, not only in terms of agricultural productivity and profitability, but also how that contributes to social inclusion and environmental sustainability. So that's the first aspect. We need a platform for systematic research in agroecology in our developing countries. The second one is that we need uh, to do research on agroecology be beyond the farm level. I think we have listened already that uh, today a lot, we need to work on policies, we need to work on business models, and in all those contextual aspects, aspects that are uh, needed to enable our ecological transitions. And the third aspect I want to highlight, uh, Etienne, is that we need also to understand better what are those effective scaling strategies 
to do agroecology at a scale. So we need to work with policymakers, yes, how we can integrate better policies that support agroecology at a scale. We need to work with the private sector. We need to work with markets to see how we understand and find effective avenues to take agroecology at a scale. So I'm going to stop here because I want now to give the floor to my colleague, Matthew, who, who is going to add on, on these aspects that we are thinking in the CGIR in terms of researching agroecology. Thank you, Etienne. Thank you, Marcela. Matthew, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Marcela. Thank you, Etienne. Um, and as Marcela has made very clear, I think um, the challenge for agroecology now is not only demonstrating the application of agroecology agro principles that, that can lead to uh, you know, resilient and sustainable agriculture, but now perhaps more importantly, and has been said by others, is determining mechanism, mechani mechanisms that encourage uptake across a wide range of real world um, so, socio-ecological context. And one point that, that His Excellency, the Ambassador from Mexico made uh, very clearly um, was that we need more research on policies. Um, and this point was also, I think, emphasized very clearly in the poll just now. So certainly the lack of, and sometimes counterproductive laws and policies, and for instance, subsidies are one of the more critical impediments to agroecology, um, agroecological transformation. And for this reason, one of the key components of the new initiative that the CGIR is putting together is to better understand the policy environment in the countries that we're going to be working in, to investigate in partnership with policymakers themselves, as well as communities, farmers and other stakeholders, how existing policies need to change and what new policies are needed from both a national perspective, but also more locally to create an enabling environment and promote the uptake of agroecology. Um, the Agroecology Initiative also recognises that a critical piece of the jigsaw is, is more understanding of the behaviour of consumers and others, and how changing behaviour can also contribute to promotion of agroecology and uptake. So just as one example, consumers understanding the importance for their health of more, more diverse food products, produced in nutrient-rich soils and without the application of agro agrochemicals, and then perhaps being willing to pay a premium for foods produced in this way. And as a result, there's also a work package in the initiative that will investigate behaviour and, and ways to influence behaviour, not just of consumers, um, but of all food system actors, including the farmers themselves. Um, and then a, another critical element of the initiative is to provide a very solid evidence base of the effects of agroecological practices, not only on productivity, but also the environment at landscape and regional scales, and be able to compare this with other options and, and business as usual. We want to be able to say what the impact will be on soil and water and biodiversity when agroecology is scaled up and over short and long term timescales. And we want to be able to give policymakers confidence that new policies that they that promote agroecology will not have un, unintended consequences, including for sectors outside of the agricultural sector, so for water and energy and so forth. And we need to be able to quantify both biophysical and livelihood consequences. And what's more, in an era of climate change, we also need to be able to say how application of agroecological practices will impact on the resilience of agri-food systems. And for, and for this reason, another critical component of the initiative is a holistic assessment framework. Um, so this will require very much a multidisciplinary approach, looking at different elements of biophysical and social economics, um, and, and a system that's developed with communities and other stakeholders to enable comparison of agroecology practices um, against the other options, including business as usual, in each of the living labs where we want to work. Uh, and this will include, of course, quantifying as far as possible trade-offs, and there inevitably will be trade-offs, um, for example, in terms of, of labour, uh, and provide evidence for strategies that might help, help mitigate those trade-offs. So this is just very, very briefly an overview of this research programme that's being developed at the moment. Um, the proposal is now being written and is, is being um, submitted for, for funding reviews. Uh, Marcella and I are very excited about the initiative that we hope will start in January next year. We think it's an innovative research program 
it will certainly do research differently from the way the CG's done research in the past. Uh, and we think it's critically, it, or we think it focuses very much on the issues that are needed for scaling agroecology for smallholders. Clearly, this is a very urgent need if food systems are to transform rapidly over the next decade. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matthew and Marcella. And, and I would add, because I'm not sure you said it, is that this initiative is gathering a wide partnership of other organizations outside the CG and is based on this leading lab concept that is extremely participatory from the start. So uh, thank you very much for this presentation. And with that, I would ask to um, Vincent to take the floor to present the TPP, which is a, a, an attempt to answer and to address the challenge that have been raised uh, all along in this uh, in this event about the challenge that the research much 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 need meets. So Vincent, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Etienne, and and good afternoon, uh, everyone. And I'll share. Uh, I have a presentation, so I'll I'll, I'll share it. Uh, I hope you can see it now. Uh, so uh, my yeah, name is Vincent Gitz, and I'm with, with C4 ECRAF, uh, the director of the CGI research program of forestry and agroforestry. And yes, I'll present on the transformative partnership platform, which is already a living response from, from research of, of some of the challenges we've seen, we've seen today. So uh, I have, uh, I'm going to show how the TPP emerged and, and, what, it, and what it can do. So, uh, the TPP has emerged from, from two parallel processes during the last decade. If we, if we go back to the reform of the CFS in 2009 with the emergence of the topic in several discussions, FAO convening two global symposia in 2014 and 2016, and 2017, the CFS that requested an HLP report on agroecology and other innovations, the report number 14 that led to the adoption in 2021 of the CFS recommendation, and now the UN Food Systems Summit and the Agroecology Coalition. So a strong global emerging demand the last decade from the, 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 the policy side, and then the positioning of the international research bodies to help formulate the agenda to support implementation at scale started in the CG and, and with uh, FTA making over agroecology in 2017, one of its operational priorities. Then Fergus Sinclair is not with us today, was, was appointed to lead the HLP report. In 2018, uh, a collaboration uh, that was imposed between France and the CG around three priorities, climate change, food systems, and agroecology. And the dossier that is launched today is in fact one of, of the outputs and uh, the outcomes of this collaboration, as is, and Etienne can speak about that, the Montpellier International Workshop in 2019 that led to the call for action. I think you, have, you had a link in the chat and the prefiguration of the TPP with its partners and, and then the launch of the TPP earlier. Uh, uh, this, this year. So all of that is a kind of a recent blossoming, but it has quite profound roots, both in the political arena and also in the research arena of, I would say, uh, the, last, the last decade. So uh, winds of change that have accelerated since the HLP report, uh, the preparation of the Food Systems Summit, and then the emergence of, of the coalition. And what we, what we could say in a way is uh, to simplify that the, the, the TPP is in, in a way a baby of the CFS. And also because of that, it helped turn the tables uh, at the World Food System Summit that uh, in fact led to the emergence of a coalition uh, for the transformation of food system through agroecology that was uh, a very important development for, for the whole community. So, what is the role of the TPP and what are the added values? First, we've heard that today, doing research differently to address persisting and new knowledge gaps or emerging knowledge gaps. Second, to work with policymakers and stakeholders to address implementation gaps. Sometimes the solutions are there, the, the upscaling is an issue. And then looking at the diversity of contexts, but within a common comprehensive approach, but most importantly in all of that, working demand-driven, not, not supply-driven. Uh, we can now, what could be interesting because of the, 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 the no emergence of the coalition is to look at uh, the, the work of the TPP through the lens of, of the coalition. Okay, the TPP has facilitated 
the emergence of the coalition and now it could be at its service as a research and knowledge arm gathering uh, research actors and partner working driven driven uh, with the with the stakeholders and uh, we can look today at the four objectives of the coalition and how the TPP is already uh, contributing to, to each of them with some emblematic examples. Uh, uh, the first objective of the coalition is to implement the policy recommendation of CFS and the certain principles of the HLP, and these are exactly the foundation of the TPP. The principles so perfuses the ways of works and, 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 and its operation. And just to give one example very briefly, uh, here, the TPP project uh, on metrics funded by, uh, by EU IDPA that implements the recommendation, recommendation number two of the, of the CFS, that is to establish and apply comprehensive performance measurements and monitoring frameworks. And here, what the TPP will do is not to start everything from scratch. There is already a lot of work that has been done, the FAO tapes framework, as well as other frameworks, and what we're going to do in the TPP with everyone on board is to help them to get uh, to link them together and to add value and this blending uh, can be done because the tpp is not owned owned by one institution it, it gathers the the set of institution actors at the table if we take the second uh, the second objective of the coalition uh, it is completely central to the tpp because it deals with research but here the how is more important than the what uh, the how is to do it through lo promoting local innovation, transdisciplinary approaches, scientists, farmers, indigenous people, other stakeholders of the food system. And this is why, uh, following also the recommendation of the, H the HLP, the, the TPP is putting agency as one of its core elements, meaning providing uh, the actors the means to do the choices by themselves and to be empowered by proper governance. Uh, of course, uh, there are different contexts uh, and different stages of development and there is not a single uh, transition pathway, but many transition pathways. Uh, we've heard that before today, they all need to be understood and supported. And basically we work into options by context, but also I would say transitions by context. The third, uh, domain of uh, the new coalition is to strengthen the consistency of the various sectoral policies. And here uh, on the right side of this slide, just to mention the example, I think Etienne has made reference to that, a very important part of the work of the TPP is to look at policies, to, to review them, but also to make advice on, on how policies at different level uh, can be put in place to support uh, the agroecological transition. It's a project that is uh, led by colleagues in Sihad, Yves Pri, Sifari Craft, and so on, many, uh, many involved. Uh, first phase, and it's also seeking funding for, for, for its next operational phases. Uh, last domain of the coalition, ensuring that public and private investment promote the adoption of large-scale implementation of agroecological policies. And one of the very first projects of the TPP that was put in place and through French funding and, and, and FTA support was to understand what are, uh, in fact, what are the business cases for socioeconomic viability of agricultural practice across Africa, uh, uh, across uh, nine African countries and, 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 and groundwork. So this is exactly the kind of, of information that you need to then support upscaling and investments by, by private sector. So basically, uh, so much I can say in eight minutes, the TPP has really taken off very quickly, but in fact is rooted on, on quite solid <laughs> roots and grounds, gaining traction. It has a governance structure that associates many partners. It has eight domains of research. We call it a docking station or central component uh, to perform key transversal functions. Uh, it has now a portfolio of close to 20 million of projects uh, that were generated by the TPP and then also 60 a million of, of, of projects that are aligned or attached now to it and, and more in the pipeline. So what's coming next? I think the first thing is to, to, to try to understand how we can really support this coalition moving forward, because this is the kind of coalition that we need for transformative action. And we, we also need it because we need to make sure that the answer from research is answering the demand, which will come from there. Then second, we need to link, deepen the linkages with national systems. I think millions' voices 
completely fundamental here. Uh, uh, we've heard him earlier on. We need to help build the One CG initiative, and we are doing that. That is in the making, uh, as Marcel and Mathieu have just presented, and, and possibly dock it to the TPP because it's going to be one very strong component of that. We need to grow the community. There is a community of, of practice. Please, everybody that has joined, the, who have joined the webinar, please uh, join the, the community on practice and enrich the discussion there. And then, of course, we need also to increase funding. Uh, for And, and, and we, here is the challenge, funding for the genuine agroecological research, not just a repainting of, of all stuff. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vincent. Uh, for this presentation now, I will pass uh, very quickly um, the, the floor to Catherine, uh, and when she installs uh, uh, slides, I would just like to recognize there are many questions coming, all, all very interesting questions and comments. We are trying to synthesize them for the next round of, of interaction, but uh, I would engage uh, the participants to take uh, note of the panelists and contact them if there are specific questions, but we will try to follow up on all these questions, very rich. Catherine, you have the floor for seven minutes. Thank you. My name is Catherine Dambele. I'm a tree domestication scientist based at INERA, a national resource uh, institute, agrocultural resource in Burkina Faso. I'm going to talk about the role of uh, uh, NAS for efficient agroecological transition. Then uh, uh, there is a long-term collaboration between National Agricultural Research System and uh, the, the International Agricultural Research and then also the Developed Countries uh, institute, research institute. I will call all this one International Research Institute. There are a lot of uh, projects that have been implemented and there are many are going on also, but um, so far uh, the advantage that are concluded from this uh, include the leveraging resources and linking uh, link it to the rest of global research activity, capacity building. There are many students that have been trained within all these collaboration projects. And then it was also opportunity for funding for the NAS that have not enough fund from their own, own countries. But there are also some many, many other challenges, that, including funding issue, mainly funding issue, because often it is a small part that, that, that goes to the NAS, impeding the implementation of the projects on, on the ground. And uh, recently, there are been, in 2016, uh, there is impact assessment study that revealed that there are few credible studies with plausible res results for sub-Saharan Africa, in spite of 40% of the resources that was invested uh, by the CG centers. And uh, another constraint is that the capacity building is also decreasing because of the, the short-term research funds. Uh, nowadays, they are not long-term research funds, they are mostly short-term research funds. But what can be the added value for including NAS to agroecological transition activities now? And uh, it was already said, like uh, uh, in the, the agro agricultural system, there is also a need for change for the collaboration between the International Research Institute and the NAS. That is a new paradigm that we need also to change. Then it is rightful, but it is also legitimate to get NAS solely involved in the project uh, from quite from the beginning. Then uh, that will give value to the various research being implemented by the NAS using their own fund, but also the external fund collaborating with the, the other uh, institution like the CG and the, the 
the institute from uh, developed countries. And uh, in line with agroecological principles that we are discussing uh, now, uh, which is giving great importance to local knowledge and then uh, uh, capacity in the alongside with uh, knowledge capacity and capacity scientific capacity and knowledge alongside with scientific scientific knowledge and technology and also it is context specific that we are we are discussing and then the contribution of the NAS can be obvious because they understand better the local context they can uh, collect data about the knowledge locally analyze them and then improve the understanding globally of the results that will be uh, obtained from all these uh, studies. The NAS can then involve also and influence more efficiently uh, lo local policy discussion and uh, discuss better with the policymaker involvement. Uh, because they have, they, some of them at least have good scientific also uh, scientists within the, the institution. But uh, I think we can discuss about that some requirement that uh, agroecological is specific and the partnership also should be uh, specific uh, as we are discussing from, and then learn, we should learn from the previous mistake or, or, or error. And uh, this is why the publishing fail results, uh, research research is also good. And then we can learn from that. And then we can also develop productive and efficient uh, collaborative relationship that will strengthen, strengthen the partnership that should be systematic way, in systematic way, the implication for the whole system and for involvement and coordination as we said, uh, it is a holistic approach. And then we need also to be active and to manage, uh, to, to get dynamic management of the collaboration relationship. For instance, we can avoid getting uh, one focal point staying for long time, for many years, and then, and then let involve other scientists with uh, other disciplines that we say that it should be uh, uh, several disciplines that can work together and uh, and and address the the many challenges that we are facing. Then can we you wrap also up, need... uh, Catherine. Yeah, the okay, last slide. Then, mm -hmm. Okay, that's the last slide. We need co-learning approach, improving monitoring and evaluation procedure, and. Uh, uh, where all partners are learning from each other, it's all already said. And then we need to allocate also more funds to the groundwork and then uh, uh, involve in research, uh, researching the means to improve extension and adoption. There are some examples of co-developing local solutions. Uh, Stephanie has uh, already talked about that like plan comparison or rural resource centers, those are approaches developed at ICRA. And then the researchers from the NARS also need to be reflexive on all these place. And uh, this TPP partnership is an opportunity, I think, especially the viability project that will allow us to build resilience for livelihood and also for landscape. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine, uh, for this three presentation. And from the question, I would like to bounce back to the panelists uh, about a very specific action that came frequently in the, in the Q&A section. And I would like all the panelists to put their, their camera on. This question is about uh, something that has been mentioned by the panelists of the part two. Uh, the epistemic superiority of researcher mentioned my million when you interact at, at local level. Obviously, Vincent presented very global things, but uh, there is also this challenge at local level about the interaction with stakeholders. So this epistemic superiority, the, the time factor that Guy mentioned before, the time of change is not the project time, et cetera. The new roles for research, not only producing knowledge, but also 
promoting interaction, etc. The, the, the question, the very odd question of capacity, Rick uh, mentioned the low capacity of, of uh, stakeholders just to keep records, but I can mention also the low capacity of researchers sometimes to connect with the local reality of the context. So it's not only to, con to collect da data from interaction is not only to collect data and to interview people, it's to engage with them. So my question in, in synthesize would be, first of all, to Marcela, what is the added value of the living lab and how you see uh, the, the researcher of the CG and, the, and this initiative to be able to cope with this challenge of really interaction with local people? And then I, I will go around and maybe with uh, also Catherine, but first of all, this question, Marcela and Matthew. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Etienne. And, and we have been thinking a lot on, on this living lab concept concept and how we also adapt uh, the concept to uh, thinking on two main things is how the living labs are those spaces that enable uh, the scientists not only from the CIR but from national centers and also the local users to co-design together those innovations that are required to uh, address problems that are identified jointly with people living in those territories. And this is, this is actually so, so, something, something that Million has highlighted very well. I mean, since the problem formulation, we need to do that with, together with people that are going to be using that and that are the, the ones that ultimately make the decisions on, on those territories. So Living Labs is for that co-design and co-development of innovations. And it means that we scientists have to arrive with that very different attitude. We need to listen. We need to, to understand what are people preferences and so on. And the second function of the living labs is connecting. So how we can connect what happened in those territories, territories with other food system actors that are important to, to, to make those agroecological innovation long lasting and viable and scalable. So, so that part of co-creation and connecting with others are key features of the living labs. And of course, these living labs benefit if, I mean, this living lab concept benefit if we have like a network of living labs across different contexts. So we can make comparisons of different agroecological transition pathways. So I want to stop there uh, because my colleagues may, may want to say something else. That's connect with another aspect of the question is that how researchers are evaluated so far in the CG and in many other uh, uh, research organizations, they're evaluated by publication and they're not evaluated by the capacity to connect with local people. So uh, uh, this, this question is very important. I would like to follow up on another question that has been raised in the public, in the audience about uh, uh, how you measure the agroecological change in your research. So it's obvious it's not only the yield, and Vincent mentioned that it's connected with social and economic aspect, but uh, what are the set of indicators to tackle the diversity of situation? Um, uh, and maybe Vincent can touch this a little bit about, because uh, I know that uh, in the TPP, we have the viability project and Catherine can complete the, the answer as well. What is the set of indicators for the performance of agroecology? No, well, uh, thanks, Etienne. It's a good question, and it comes back to, to in fact, you, your first one, is that, in fact, the performance of agroecology is something that works for the farmers and for the value chains. Now, what we've seen is we, we're building a toolbox that goes from the plot to the farm, to the value chains, and to the food system to, to look at different dimensions of, of what it means performance. But ultimately, uh, and this is the reason of agency, putting agency at the core, is that uh, the trade-offs, the choices will need to be made by, by the actors themselves and not by others. That, that's often a critique of conventional agriculture that the solutions are imposed to farmers, which is also a critique to research in, in the past, the way it was traditionally done be, with a kind of classical pilot uh, uh, phase in experimental farms and then a scaling up in the fields that could never be as good as the pilot and basically the farmers were the culprits. No, here we're doing 
uh, in fact, the, as we like to say, the farmers are doing the research and we're learning from, from that and from the options. Now, what it would mean is, is and, and just to mention also one of the points to your very interesting first question is we need to work differently also with economic actors, with cooperatives. So for instance, when, you need, when, when, you, when, when we have a project currently in Para with, um, uh, with uh, Amazon and, and the Nature Conservancy uh, to develop um, uh, new agroforestry, diversified agroforestry system over degraded pastures. So these are lands that are overgrazed, are not productive anymore. But the bottleneck is, is not necessarily the technical aspects in the field. It is how the cooperatives are able to treat a diversity of, produ of produce, transform a diversity of produce, sell them, etc. So this really needs that we, uh, in fact, good research on farming systems needs to be complemented by uh, the, the research or options on the enabling environment. Okay, okay. So we need to get a bit our hands dirty also with that. Okay, so it's linked also with the capacity of researchers to do that. I, I would last uh, uh, question with Catherine because that has been raised in the audience about the rights of farmers and smallholders. Since interaction is not only collecting the data and sending an USB key uh, at the end of the project with the results. Uh, that means that the rights of the farmers in this research project is, is at stake and the right of farmers organizations. So uh, how you, from a NARS perspective, you see the legitimacy of, of this living lab with international researchers uh, uh, to respect the rights of farmers and, uh, and ultimately uh, the, the, the restore the trust of farmer to research because somebody in the audience mentioned that uh, the, the, there is not always trust between farmers and researchers. So how do you see restoring the trust with farmers in their rights and in their expectation to reinforce their capacity to innovate? Catherine, in a few minutes. I think one thing is also uh, increasing the awareness awareness regarding uh, the what is do what is being doing because we have a lot of constraints and the farmers are aware of that and then we increase this and sensitize them about that and then as we said we we, we uh, make the research from them it should be a, a, a collective uh, way of researching that's what we are trying to do from the viability project ask them what is what they think about what they have been doing, what they, they did, what are the constraints, and then also ask what they, they think that can be uh, uh, do to avoid all these uh, 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 things that we are doing. We need to get them confident on, on this and then get back uh, to them the result of what we are doing. As Thank you, Catherine. So uh, th this was very really rich. If you see the Q&A section was very really rich, but we have some, uh, we are late uh, and, and we have to close this event, very interesting event. And I would like with that uh, to check if uh, Juan Lucas uh, arrives, I I is he here with us? Yes, here. he is. Yes. Here at the end. I'm here. Hi, hi, Juan Lucas, how are you? So I'm happy to see you. I don't know how much you got from the, the, the exchange, but it's been very rich with almost 400 uh, participants. So I would like to give you the floor to have some closing remarks. Uh, you are the, the general direct, global director for partnership in the CG, a, a new position, and uh, at the same time, general director of the Alliance side by biodiversity. So uh, you are very well positioned to comment on agroecology research in, in the CG and, and beyond. You have the floor for five minutes. Thank you, Etienne, and uh, hello, everybody. It's great to be here. And, and as you well say, Etienne, I come here with a number of hats, the CGIR hat, the Alliance hat, uh, a long-standing connection uh, with French institutions. I was also a colleague for the Manage Area and Action Track 3 of the UN uh, FS Food, Food System Summit. And a few months back, uh, we tried uh, and were successfully helping to bring TPP and CGIR closer together. And I was very pleased uh, to use this great event uh, to launch this fantastic, my camera is not helping, but uh, the, here it is, our great, our great book uh, on a, a special partnership issue and partnership is absolutely critical on agroecological transformation for sustainable food systems where we are highlighting 
the multidisciplinary expertise of CGIR French research organizations with about 70 partners where we are enhancing you know, these agroecological principles across food, land, uh, water uh, systems and showing the enormous capacity already there to integrate more of these very different disciplines when conducting the transdisciplinary research needed to support agroecological transition in support of food systems uh, transformation. So it's a great uh, book. Uh, I am already passing it to many people that say, OK, where can we learn more about how our organizations can implement some of these uh, principles? Because we're still lagging uh, evidence uh, and, and data from, from research. And this is what we've been hearing uh, throughout uh, the whole uh, conversation today. I'm also very uh, pleased at the end to, to say that uh, the new 2030 Research and Innovation Strategy of CGIR is very different from the traditional CGIR strategies and, and centers. And we, are already, we have already adopted important principles of agroecology uh, related, for example, to circularity, boosting environmental ecosystem health in step with productivity, the diversification, the supporting uh, of, of human, uh, healthy human uh, diets, and of course, making sure how all of these enhancements uh, of systems need to go hand in hand uh, with equitable benefits for men, women, uh, young people, respecting plurality, respecting cultural values, and a greater degree of co-creation of knowledge with our partners. So there is a great momentum uh, around uh, all of this. But again, as we heard today, there are still gaps. And as you well said at the end, there are still the lack of defining incentives to really be able to embrace the kind of research ag and agroecological uh, transition and transformation needs. So we, we basically need, and, and, and from what we uh, could uh, capture today, uh, we need to keep producing scientific evidence on how and under what conditions these approaches in comparison to others enhance social agency, deliver socioeconomic outcomes and prioritize healthy uh, nutrition and environment. And, and this analysis of trade-offs uh, is gonna be absolutely critical in multidimensional outcomes such as productivity, social inclusion, and environmental health. The second element is how do we move aggressively, I would say, uh, beyond the farm level and understanding how we incorporate uh, these principles, fairness, environmental stewardship, cultural values in business models that involve farmers, but where the uh, incentives uh, for their, uh, their participation and the mechanisms to improve connectivity between farmers and consumers. And there is still a big gap there that we need to, we need to cover. The other element is how to keep working and learning uh, on research in the co-creation of innovations by combining the scientific and other stakeholders' uh, knowledge and making sure uh, we are well adapted to context and understanding that context, one context does not easily relate to another one, but still uh, we need to learn uh, to make the, the connections and create as ma many commonalities as possible while still respecting and understanding the specificities uh, of the local conditions, communities, uh, etc. And the last thing, of course, is how uh, we get these commitments uh, beyond uh, farming across uh, other actors. So we uh, can influence from science, business models, fair policies for all uh, a healthy uh, planet. And this is why uh, we need to finalize to make sure uh, agroecology can engage in a better uh, and more effective way policymakers, the private sector, and other food system investors. So we are on the right track. It's difficult. Uh, 10 years ago, this was a little bit in the clouds. Now there is a lot of evidence, still a huge knowledge gap, but we are driving uh, agroecological transformation in the right direction. Thanks a lot all and back to you, Etienne. Thank you, Juan Lucas, for this excellent closing remarks. Uh, in summary, challenge for everybody, challenge for researchers, challenge for research organization, challenge for funders, challenge for agency, 
Uh, and agroecology is, is a difficult point because it's not the silver bullet. There are so many agroecological pathways. There is no transfer of solution. They have to be built at the, with interaction with local stakeholders and at the same time be credible uh, globally to convince that there is a, an advantage and, and it is not, it's never a miracle solution. So thank you. I, I would like to thank, I would like to be uh, in, in, in person here to ask for a round of applause for our panelists because it was uh, fascinating the, the matter that has been brought up uh, in these panels. Obviously, the, 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 as usual, the Q&A section was extremely rich. I would invite uh, people to convey, we, we take care, we take good note of the comments for the TPP. TPP is still a modest thing, you know, but we, we taking good note of everything that has been said. We invite people who want to connect with panelists to, to come directly to them. We try to follow up on these comments, but I would uh, finish uh, to uh, thank you all for the very good audience uh, for this event and, and see you in the next event of the TPP and hoping that the, all this presentation will concretize in the CG initiative and in other projects. Thank you very much.